on behalf of the director of Brahma Kumari Parishad, Sister Gita, and all students of the Brahma Kumari of Kibu Center, and of course, on behalf of the Supreme Father, every belong, everything here belongs to him. We are heartily happy to see you here, welcome you. We thank you very much for having accepted very graciously our invitation. Despite the challenging weather, during the day it was quite sunny, and just half an hour before the <laughs> session, rain started pouring, and many were caught up in the traffic jam. And this area is quite famous for traffic jam, but luckily there's a program, uh, infrastructure program that's coming, that sooner it will be much smoother for you to come here. <coughs> so, it is indeed an honor, of course, to have welcome Brother Charles Hogg, but we all affectionately call you Charlie Bhai, Brother Charlie. We are very much thankful for you to be here, and, uh, and I'm sure we're going to talk more about him. So, um, you all are aware about the topic that we are going to speak about is mastering the power within. But before doing that, I would like to talk more about our guest speaker, our brother Charlie. You may please do forgive me if my paper is too small to really describe him as he is. Brother Charlie is the national coordinator of in our business job research executive of the Brahman Maris, Australia. He is also an active member of the Brahman Maris International Coordinating Group, who is responsible for major international projects and the administrative direction of the organization's global network of centers. But before joining the institution, I would like to read a portrait of himself. Brother Charlie was studying architecture at the Melbourne University when he felt an urge to travel to explore the various spiritual philosophies and travel more than three years through Asia, Middle East, and Europe. During this time, he lived in many communities, including Buddhist, Christian, Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, and Taoist, which led him to probe more deeply into questions about life and death and transformation. He used to ask himself, a question. How I, one person, can contribute in any way that really makes a better world? Anyway, that really makes a better world. He's making, when I read this line, if I continue, I reminded myself of him this song. Not a good thing, I'm not saying, but I can straight away translate for you. Or I will say the line, I think, it's an old song. Job nele ji kya ji, ye dil zamane ki hai. What it means? It means that what a life would it be without serving the humanity? So his heart from the very beginning has been to serve the world. 
It was then in the mid 1970s that he came into contact with the Brahma Kumaris and began meditating. As a senior teacher of the Brahma Kumaris these days, he travels extensively and has visited more than more than 80 countries. As a speaker at international conferences, the list is very long. I would like just to state one, including Harvard Law School and of course many VK public programs. The topic, I will not go more detail on that, but if you have read it, you know that these days what the state of the world is and how it impacts the state of the mind. People are fearing fear, fear, fear or anxiety. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Sometimes they say that you will live up to 90, 80 years. Few days you have to leave company. There are many things, you know, people can't, don't know how to greet someone when they have COVID or whatever. There are a lot of things that are preoccupying those people that people ask you to leave me that we totally forget how to handle ourselves. So this is this topic is very befitting at this point in time after two years. Luckily we're able to now come and meet in a gathering. So Brajali was to come before the beginning, before even COVID began, but somehow we missed him and now he's here. So without taking much of your time and his time, okay. so I will invite each body to deliver his wisdom on this topic and guide us. Thank you. to be with you tonight and thank you Amanda for your lovely welcome I think this is my fourth time to Mauritius and um, the last time was in 2015 so there's been quite a bit of time in between but I always love to come here because of the, the warmth and the friendliness of the people of this beautiful country. And what I'd love to do tonight is to share some of my thoughts and there will be little time for some questions, some discussion. And then as you know, we will finish with some meditation. And the topic, mastering the power within. <coughs> I think power is a very loaded word these days, would you agree? I think quite a controversial word because I think the image of power when we listen to that word is of force and domination and control and even more than that, abuse and corruption, unfortunately. But perhaps we could call that hard power because tonight we're going to really explore soft power which is really, I think, a power which all of us have within. The power of love, the power of peace, the power of goodwill, and much more. And if I was to ask all of you a question, what do you need most in your life as an individual? I wonder what you would say. Because so many times over the years I've asked groups of people, what do you need most? And you know the most common answer I get is inner power, inner strength. Because most people feel they know what they want to change. We know ourselves well enough. We know there's a lot of things in me and I prefer weren't there. I would like to change. 
I know where I want to be. I know I want to step out of where I am now and step into another place. But the real question is, where do I get the strength? Where do I get the power? And I think, you know, it's a universal thing in most of us. I really want to deal with my lack of self-confidence that appears sometimes. I really want to deal with self-doubt. I really want to deal with that mind that can be chronically negative sometimes. And perhaps more recently, I really want to deal with these anxious thoughts that a lot of us have about our future, about our families, and much more. And so that question is really, where do I get the strength? And perhaps there's so many ways to describe spirituality. But one way to describe spirituality is mastering the power of him. The culture of today somehow seems to drain us of our intrinsic internal strength. And the whole concept of spirituality is to gently, with wisdom, take back my sense of inner power. And one of the things I love about spirituality <coughs> is that sometimes we have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with myself. You know, I think it's really important to have this honest heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And one question I've asked myself so many times, who is powerful in my life? Who is powerful in my life? Is it other people's opinions? How powerful can they be sometimes? Other people's opinions can completely change your perception of something. Is it my emotions? How powerful are they sometimes? In a split second, your mind is taken over by a wave of hurt or anger, completely disempowers you. Or maybe your karmic story. How powerful can that be sometimes? You want to go in one direction, but somehow life takes you in another direction. Or is it even situations, the situations of life? Or is it really my intrinsic sense of who I am as a person? And perhaps even maybe my connection with God? Because what I'm observing in our incredibly unpredictable world, unless I have an anchor into my internal power, what happens is I go along in life and then suddenly something happens and I go into a spin, complete spin, I have no control. And after a while I step back, something else happens and I go into this spin. And in a way, I have no sense of internal strength as to how to stop the spinning of the mind. So that first question really, who is powerful in my life? Is it me or is it all these external things? The second question, what fills me with power and what drains me of power? To do a little self-audit of myself, I wonder, anyone an accountant here? Sometimes it's important to do this little sort of self-audit. And you know, <clears throat> have you noticed when you feel happy that you can work for 18 or 20 hours? Have you ever noticed that when you're in this good mood, you're in good spirits, you're positive, you can work, 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 and you don't feel tired? Observe the thoughts you're having at that time. They're positive thoughts. They're thoughts of good thoughts about yourself. They're thoughts of well-being about others. You have a mission that's positive. But on the other hand, that if you feel unhappy, if you feel upset, and you feel tired almost instantly. Observe the sort of thoughts you're having there. The negative thoughts, you know, fear, anxiety, worry about any outcomes, or the wasteful thoughts. And to me, one of the great drains on our inner resources is this chronic addiction to wasteful thinking about the future. The biggest question in the minds of humanity today is what will happen? What will happen to me? What will happen to my family? What will happen to my business? What will happen to my economy? And so many thoughts go in that direction. It drains me of power. Or I go back into the past. Why did this happen? Why did they do this? 
And all these, in a sense, misuse of my mind completely drains me of my inner resources. And, you know, sometimes I think that really we're at a, a time when we really need to harness my inner power and really observe, you know, what is filling me and what is draining me, be like a self-auditor. And one of the things, you know, I found fascinating in my education was that I learned so much about the world out there. You know, how many years do we go to school or university? 15, 18 years. I hardly think I learned anything much about the world in here, about my mind. Did anyone study about the mind at school? How to manage it? No. Well, there's one. <laughs> She's a special person. <laughs> because we become a victim of our own mind. And the whole of my life takes place in my mind. You think your thoughts, your feelings, your reactions, your relationships, your memories, it's all taking place here. If your mind isn't in a state of wisdom and love, honestly, the thoughts and feelings just drain you of your inner peace and inner power. And the mind is a wonder. Science tells us that in a waking day, the mind creates 30 to 50,000 thoughts in a day of 16 hours. I don't know how they count them, but no idea, but there's a lot of thinking. One scientist says you can speak about 125 words a minute, but you think about 500. You know how when you're talking to someone, how many other things are happening in your mind? In psychology, they say, you can be aware on seven different levels of any given moment. Just like me, I'm speaking at the moment, I'll be thinking what I'll say next. I'm watching your response, I'm watching people coming in the back. You know your mind is processing so many bits of information. And light, light travels at 186,000 miles a second. Your mind is instant. Your mind is instant. As you sit here, if someone in India or someone in Europe thinks of you, you pick up that thought message in the inbox of your mind absolutely instantly. This mind is a wonder. And if we're exploring power, I really have to explore my own mind. <coughs> you know, sometimes I think of my mind as like a sacred space. And I think the image I love for my mind is like a crystal bowl of pure still water, so still, so clean, so pure. But there's gateways into the mind, my ears. Someone criticizes me, someone makes a comment. I let it in my ear, into my mind, think, 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 think. I see someone's behavior, bad behavior. I see some injustice. I let it through my eyes, into my mind, think, think, think. I remember, I remember something of the past, it bubbles into my mind, think, think, think. It's like I'm dancing to the tune of the external world. Whatever happens out there is triggering my mind, and I'm just really not in power, I'm just actually like a slave to everything which is really happening around me. And this is why meditation is such an extraordinary tool. Because what am I doing? I'm sitting down and I'm creating the thoughts I want. I'm actually creating the thoughts I want in my mind and converting them into a feeling. So gently, gently, I'm taking back my power. Rather than my mind just reacting to life, something happens, think, think, think. Here's some news, think, think, think. I'm sitting down and I'm creating the thoughts which I want. How important is that? And to me, inner power is really, I would say, the power to create and sustain quality thoughts. The power to have goodwill for other people. The power that when a situation goes bad, Allowing myself to understand it, not suppress it, but not overthink about it. 
our addiction is when a little thing happens, someone says something I don't like, we cannot stop my mind. I have no power to put a full stop. See, that's enough. It's only making me unhappy. It's the power to respect others. The mind really has enormous power if I know where to take it from. And to me, there's like three internal resources we take power from. I would say the first is the intellect, intellectual power. And that is the power that enables us to get a good job, make money, understand the world outside. But if I feel anxious, if I feel depressed, does that sort of intelligence help? I don't think so. The second sort of power is like emotional power. Sometimes they call it emotional intelligence these days, which is simply the power to create rich, loving, sustainable relationships. How important is that in life? But I may be a person who has really, who's really good with other people. I can read their faces, I know how to respond. It doesn't mean that I have a loving relationship with me. The third type of power is spiritual power. Spiritual intelligence. And I feel if emotional intelligence is the wisdom to build rich, loving relationships with others, spiritual intelligence is the power to build a rich, loving relationship with me. The first step to spiritual power is to heal the broken relationship with me. You know, sometimes I feel the first relationship in life is with me. If that relationship is not healthy, it pollutes each and every part of my life. There's a lot of data that says it affects my health. It definitely affects how I feel. It will definitely affect my relationships in my family and with anyone, and it will affect my performance at work. And sometimes I feel, look at our world. What do you feel about our world? It's a fairly crazy world, isn't it, that we're living in at the moment. Why? Because I really feel that when 8 billion people have a dysfunctional relationship with themselves, What's the effect on the world? If I can't respect me, will I respect others? Will I respect society? Will I respect the environment? I don't think so. And that's why I think spirituality goes to the essence. And I would say the first step in mastering the power within is to know and experience who I am. When I know who I am, I release that true internal power. Who am I? Should be the first question we learn at school, right? <laughs> but you know, the way I see it these days is in all of us there's three personalities. Two of them disempower me, make me weak, make me very vulnerable, but one of them starts me to really feel that power thing. And the first personality I call the I of arrogance or the I of superiority. And this personality takes this whole sense of identity from my, the labels of my body. Who am I? I see myself as my gender, my nationality, my religion, my profession, hundreds of labels. What is common to all those labels? They are all temporary. They are all temporary. And when my ego is ruling in my inner system, then I compare with others and I think, I am better, I am more, I am right. But when it seeps into my feelings, my emotions, that's when I feel so easily insulted, disrespected, not valued, excluded, sensitive. Anyone here sensitive? Wow, I'm impressed. No one. Wow, this is the first country I've ever been to. Mauritius gets the gold medal. I think 
think we're all a bit sensitive, aren't we? <laughs> because, you know, when the false eye is ruling my inner system, you know, my thinking, then my feeling, and the result of that, when my ego is ruling, there's a deep relationship between ego and love. The beauty of life is love. The more ego I have, the less love I taste in my life. Love is void, and love is actually spiritual power. And what happens is the more ego, the more I feel separate, I feel I don't belong, I feel disconnected. I see it's others, but I can't see that I'm under the influence of the false self. My false self is deceiving me. The result, no power. I have power on the surface. I might be loud, I might be strong, I may be forceful and controlling, but underneath it, I'm very vulnerable and fearful. The second eye is the flip side. I call it the eye of lack of self-respect or the eye of inferiority. It's like the ego of inferiority. And this eye also takes my whole sense of self from <clears throat> all the labels of my and when this eye is ruling, I compare with others, but I think others are better. Others don't love me, others don't respect me, others don't value me. This goes round and around and around inside my head. And when it comes into my feelings, I feel so easily um, hopeless about myself, inadequate, unworthy, inferior, depressed, I would say. In psychology, depression is like a sadness that my dream in life to be loved and valued hasn't happened. But in spirituality, depression is like a mourning for the loss of my true identity. I'm living my life, but who am I really? And so when I'm under the influence of this false eye, this eye of inferiority, I have a sense everyone looks down. No one really values me, but it's more my lack of self-respect. The result, no power whatsoever. So when I live my life thinking I'm a temporary body, the two children of my ego of superiority, my ego of inferiority, mean that one day I'm flying, everything's great, in one second I crash. I, I feel really down, really despondent, very pessimistic, then I'm up and then I'm down, up and down. The third eye is the original eye. And this eye thinks that I am a soul, a spirit, the Atma. The Atma in Sanskrit means three things. I, the living, the dweller in the costume. I, the permanent self, the soul. The soul is a one, because the soul exists, but it's just a point. And in mathematics, a point exists, but it has no length, breadth, or width. The soul sits in the front of the brain. It's the most subtle being, but it's I. It's the consciousness. I, the soul of you, before this body, I sit on this throne, and I'm going to continue after this body. And as I begin to really reconnect, not just believe, you know, 80% of the world's population believe there's something more than a body. We believe it, we all know. We even use the language when people die, the spirit is flown, etc. But we don't get the power from experiencing it. In a sense, meditation is converting what I know into what I feel getting the power out of truth. And I, the soul, am eternal, immortal, non-physical. And actually, when I start to reconnect with who I really am, it's like coming home to a place inside where you feel so comfortable. I can remember when I began to meditate, I was astounded. It's like I found a little sanctuary inside that was always calm, it was always sweet that is always there. It's always there, but we've forgotten how to access it. 
And it's like you take all the pressure off yourself to look good, to be something, to be noticed. And you begin to really accept who you are. There is incredible internal strength. When I just don't know and I just don't believe, but I start to practice and experience in life who I am as a soul. And sometimes I think of my inner world like a tree. A tree has a seed, a trunk, branches and leaves. My thoughts are the leaves. How many thoughts do we have? You know a big tree? How many leaves are there? Thousands and thousands. But what is feeding the leaves of my mental and emotional patterns? So if I'm a warrior, if I'm an anxious person, thinking, thinking, thinking. But what feeds the branches is the trunk, which is my subconscious. It's all the data of my past sitting in my subconscious. Freud said that 80% of human behavior was motivated by my subconscious habits. But what feeds the trunk is my sense of identity, the seed, who am I, my sense of self. And when the seed of my tree is corrupt, it's false, I think I'm a temporary body. It influences my subconscious, all my mental, emotional patterns, worry, 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 fear, 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 anxiety, thinking, too much thinking. But when I replace the seed of my inner tree, it's like a little seed of absolute power. It influences my subconscious. My whole mental and emotional pattern has become a lot more calmer and less thinking, but strong words. Why I say this is often we have negative thinking. We don't like our thoughts. You know how some thoughts are uncomfortable, so you cherry pick them out. You really make a lot of effort not to think that and not to think that. You know, what happens is you cherry pick out one and ten more grow. Is that true? <laughs> it's a difficult task. Change the seed and you begin to reprogram your life. So the first step to master the power of thing is not just to know, not just to believe, but to live more in the awareness of the true self, the permanent self, that I am a soul, actually to live in a soul-conscious way. The second step in my own personal experience is to experience true love. In my life, I believe there is no greater power than love. Would you agree? I think most people agree. And you know what I love about spirituality is you gently observe yourself, you watch your inner world. And what I've observed is when my heart is full of love, I feel so easy, so relaxed, so accepting, content. And I'm definitely a lot more compassionate and understanding towards others. The most powerful thing in life is a loving heart. A loving heart can break down barriers, fill empty hearts, heal hearts in pain, etc. But when the mind lacks love, you know, the mind can never stop. You know that agitated mind, searching, seeking, can never express why. Because something is missing. The first need in life is love, a quality of love. If that need isn't fulfilled, if that desire isn't fulfilled, what I observe is a million other desires emerge. The desire for material things, the desire for recognition, the desire for power, the desire for control. Look at our world at the moment. These are rampant, they're almost accepted as normal in the way we live, but the seed of it is a lack of that quality of love. And I feel in life, the subtext of human life is this search for true love. We invest our heart in relationships, in our families. You think, how much have you given to your family, your children, your parents, or whoever? You, you absolutely give everything. 
that there is a huge human dilemma that no relationship is permanent. Whether it's time, whether it's change, whether it's conflict, whether it's death, the object of my love will go. And that creates so much insecurity and fear, which completely disempowers me, makes me feel so vulnerable and weak. And I would say there's three sources of power in life. I say three sources of love in life. Myself, God, family, and music. And for most of us, not much love for myself. That's my personal experience. It's hard to have that really sustained loving relationship. God, many people have faith in God, but I don't think they really feel a deep, real, tangible love and belonging. So my one source of love was my family and friends. So if there's a loss, if there's a conflict, if there's a difference in life, my whole world goes into upheaval. What is spirituality? Spirituality is developing a loving relationship with myself as a soul and a loving relationship with God. And that's the platform for inner power. Why? Because they are both permanent. They don't change. Everything else will change. I invest love in this, it will change. Invest love in that, it will change. But when I build my life on that which always exists, I've got such a foundation of internal strength, and it's real. And this relationship with God, or the Supreme, or the Divine, or whatever you like to say, the way I feel it for myself these days, I'm a soul. You can see me, can't you? Because I'm expressing through my body, but actually I'm a soul. And I, the soul, speaking, you know, making these movements with my arms, and stuff. I'm acting through my body. God is a soul too, but does not have a human body. But a real, living, thinking, feeling being. And in a sense, meditation is communicating with that being. I do actions. And I reap the fruit. We know happiness. All of us in this room know happiness and we know sadness and sorrow. God is a soul that's beyond that game. But once again, a real living being. So in a sense of being who's retained power because of remaining uninfluenced and pure. Not a concept, not an intellectual idea. A real living soul. And in a sense, spirituality is learning how to connect in thought. And actually, we do it all the time. Just like I was saying before, you know how you're sitting here, as I'm speaking, people pop into your head. <clears throat> and we're just so used to it. But actually, often we receive their messages. It's like they think of you instantly. It comes into your inbox. It comes into your inbox. So actually we're constantly communicating by thought and feelings. And actually when you meet another human being, actually when you communicate with another person, 80 to 90% of the impact is non-verbal. What they say is one thing, but the feelings you get and the energy from their face, you know what I mean? You know, you get a feeling of and whether you feel comfortable or not. So actually, we're always communicating by thoughts and feelings. And in this relationship, I communicate through elevated thoughts and pure feelings. It's a real relationship. Meditation is firstly connecting with my intrinsic self and feeling the power of that. Secondly, connecting <coughs> With whom I like to say the lover of the soul. The soul that I really look for, the relationship with the divine. And to be very open with you, 
I've found as I've moved around recently, people yearn to meditate. I think because we can see our inner world is so messy. I think most people, so many people realize I need to do something. So we begin to meditate and the mind goes everywhere. Does that sound familiar? Ah, I've got a good response to that. <laughs> and you think, my God, and then you think so sort of other people, well, it looks like they're meditating, but I can't do it. Actually, it's normal. The mind goes absolutely everywhere. Because sometimes I think the concept is to meditate. I sort of have to elevate my consciousness to something. And if I even feel quite good, I feel I'm still not there. So there's always this feeling I don't do it well. And this is why in the Brahma Kumaris we use the word remember. Why? Because to remember is absolutely natural. At every millisecond, you're remembering what I have to do, what I just did, what you said, what I said. You're always remembering. And when you remember, three things happen. You connect. Even if you're sitting in this room now, you remember a child in Mauritius or America or London or Australia or anywhere, instantly the thread of your mind connects. And as soon as you connect, you're influenced by what you connect with. And then you download a feeling inside. So in other words, whatever my mind plugs into empowers me or disempowers. And often what we do is we remember an incident that happened that I didn't like. It was not right. I plug into it and I dwell on it and I dwell on it. I'm influenced by it and I feel miserable and then I wonder why I'm not happy. Because I'm connecting, I'm plugging into negative things about myself, about people, about situations. What is meditation? Actually, it's nothing more than remembering God as this being of light. And it's real. I'm not just sitting there, sort of, and shall I say, psyching myself into doing something. I'm actually connecting with a real being. And when I remember this being who is unlimited in love, belonging, Purity, power, it is a total source of inner power. And if I begin, begin to look at my life, <clears throat> what happens is we're just caught up in this cycle of action and doing. If I each morning decide I'm going to master the power within, and each morning I wake up, I sit quietly. And I start to remember who am I. I visualize myself as the soul. You know my own experience when I began to meditate? I was amazed that as soon as I really connected and felt my permanent self, the soul, my whole inner world began to cool down. There's enormous power in inner peace. And then when I look through the third eye and I visualize, I connect, not just worshipping, believing, don't have to be religious at all, I'm connecting with a real living soul. It's like you live stream all that energy back into your mind, that peace, that power, that love. And it's like you empower yourself. And to me, the third thing to really master the power thing is to do actions according to my truth. And over my life, I've developed a relationship with my conscience. My conscience is such an important part of my inner world. Because I sometimes think of my conscience as a vessel of truth. That's my truth. That's my principles. They're my values. That's who I am in one sense. If I go against my truth, if I do an action, if I cheat myself or others, or I I abuse the people I love. How do I feel? It's like I'm really being destructive to my relationship with me. 
I know truth, I believe in truth, and I have principles, and yet I break my principles. I break the contract with myself, completely disempowering myself. How do you feel when you feel guilt or shame? There's nothing more that makes you feel weaker. And that's when, when I get the power of the relationship with me, when I get the power of the relationship with God, I get the power to do actions according to my truth. And in my quiet moments, I can really feel comfortable about the person I am. I can like who I am, not with arrogance, but just because I'm living according to my values. If I keep breaking my own values, then, you know, how do I really feel about myself? You know, I don't feel good at all. And so, Spirituality is really mastering a power thing. A relationship with myself as a soul. A relationship with the divine, a natural relationship. Not just when I meditate, but as I go about my life, I keep remembering, I keep connecting. I then realize that when I do actions against my truth, all I do is disempower myself. So slowly, slowly, I'm upgrading the quality of my life. And I feel that this world is changing so fast. I can't rely on anything out there. So I have to build something solid within myself. This is spirituality. This is really spirituality. Building a stable inner world based on truth of who I am and who I belong to. And to me, you know, sometimes I think we we treat these things like a hobby. You know, we we come along to a talk occasionally. It's nice, but you know, you get a little bit of strength from it. So sometimes we treat these things like a hobby, sometimes like a discipline. I know a lot of people now who meditate very regularly. But what I think happens is that we sit to meditate, and as soon as meditation finishes, we just think in the old way. We go back to my old thinking and perception. Where it really works is when it becomes a lifestyle. I build a little structure into my life every day to gently, gently increase my power. And it's not just when I meditate. You know, I feel my attitude, I live my life as a peaceful soul. Who am I? This is my fundamental, intrinsic sort of identity. I am a peaceful soul. I'm going to live my life as a peaceful soul. And when I really bring, I marry my spiritual life with my day-to-day -day life. Because sometimes, you know, I have beliefs all here, and then I've got my work and my family, and I'm running and rushing. But actually, what really works is when I, I really express who I am, as that soul, my relationship with God, in my family life, in my working life. So it marries my real life. It's not just a belief I have. But I sit in the morning, I create an experience, and that really is how I <clears throat> carry my life out. Because we're living in incredibly unpredictable times. And I feel the more I attach my heart to things out there, we're going to be in trouble because they will constantly change. But the more I build that foundation within here, I can know stability. And once recently, <clears throat> someone said to me, you know, we often <laughs> in spirituality, you're sort of always talking about me, 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 what I need to do. But actually, the reality is, if I become stable, if I become strong, that automatically transmits to the people I love. I can tell you today that so many people are worried about family, worried about children, grandchildren, whatever. And we think, how can we help? To me, there's two types of support, emotional support and spiritual support. Emotional support is when you 
you know, you speak to people, <clears throat> they're down, they're struggling, you know, you give them some of these sacred things and you encourage them. And you love them, you want to do it. But what happens tomorrow? They come back and they're back to square one, you know. <laughs> What is spiritual support? Is when I hold the value of that person in my attitude. This is actually very deep. You know their goodness. I have seen people completely change, but no matter how much they're fluctuating, you see beyond that, you know their intrinsic value. Especially when you see the soul, you can tune into that. And when your vision is on that, they feel it even as they fluctuate. And so your support actually helps them. So the more you become strong, you can make those you love around you strong as well. Really, I think there's such an important time to really go to my spiritual reserves and really become strong. Otherwise, the nature of this world will make me fluctuate too much. Well, I'm going to put a pause button on myself now. It's not so easy sometimes, <laughs> but I have to be disciplined. And um, as I said at the beginning, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, you're most welcome. We have a little bit of time for questions, and then we will have some meditation to finish. Yes, please, the lady in the front. Um, thank you very much for your excuse. I really learned a lot this evening. I would like to ask a question relative to the soul, consciousness, and duality. I have no problems in a kind of semi intellectual manner understanding the concept of body and mind. Obviously, your body is either female or male. A mind is rational or irrational. You can quantify, you can do objectives, you can put it in kind of different corners, as it were. But for me, the soul is supposed to be oneness, as you expressed it earlier. And consciousness is supposed to be so too. In, in French, you have a, um, an expression, en âme et conscience. So in soul and in consciousness, there are two very different concepts. And when we try to achieve oneness, we try to integrate the mind, the body, the soul, the consciousness into one. So my question to you is that as I'm listening to you discuss or explain and share about souls, this is a good soul, this is, you didn't, you didn't mention a good soul, but it was kind of insinuated that you have like souls that have good actions or good quality souls. And then we talk about consciousness, which is supposed to be one, but we still have the word collective consciousness. So if consciousness is already one, why do we have to talk about collectivity? Do we have different kinds of consciousness that then become one? So my question to you is that if we aspire to unicity, which is what this is about, I am in a body, I have a mind, I have a soul, and I aspire to do a collective consciousness so that's going to be or together we can we can build something together in a collective consciousness. The question I therefore ask is what are your views, what are your thoughts on a good soul, a bad soul, um, a collective consciousness? Is there duality or is it oneness? the world now is that 
you know, each human soul, all of us sitting in this room, as they say, maybe it creates 30,000 to 50,000 unique thought patterns. So each one of us is pumping that out into an atmosphere. It's like we're living in a thought soup. And this, unfortunately, the thought soup now is so coloured by depression, anxiety, fear. We absorb it. We absorb it. So even though we're individual, we create this collective atmosphere. And to be really frank, I say to a lot of people who are meditators, <clears throat> sometimes we become slack with our practice. You know, because life is busy, and we always prioritise doing rather than being. And what happens is that if I stop really caring for my mind, I start to absorb the thoughts soon. All these negative thoughts come, worrying thoughts, anxious thoughts, because it's a very palpable energy, eight billion human souls pumping out these thoughts into the atmosphere. And so, you know, I think on the other hand that when I decide to really become soul conscious and putting a whole different vibration into this thought soup in the world. And I think that's really what we need to do at the moment, how we, when each one of us starts to live more in self-awareness and the whole vibration of a mind that's self-aware to a mind that's not, is completely different and you know, it really creates a different atmosphere in the world. So, that was one part that I must have been forget the other part. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you anyway. <laughs> Would anyone else like to ask something? Yes, please. Om Shanti. Just if I ask a question, I won't be long, please. Uh, you said that uh, you will have belief in God. But love for God is something different. Is that right? Love for God is something different. That's because belief can be here in your life, but in my opinion, love for God means you are not looking for anything. You know, you can go suddenly, go suddenly to Him. And uh, you are just looking for His grace. But once you grace that you got the grace of God, you don't need anything. That is unconditional love. Then you mentioned about uh, spiritual support. I believe spiritual support also means having good thoughts for others and praying for them as well so that they get well. That is the thing. Then the, the question I wanted to ask you is that don't you see that what we are is a product of our environment, environment the way of brought up? The education and our belief system. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely, definitely. But we live in a world where the, the seed culture is like the tree. I was explaining that the whole culture of every society in the world is body conscious. From the day we are born, we are, you are told you are a male, you are a female. You're this culture or this nationality. You're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're all the labels are put on what is temporary. And it's this culture of body consciousness which is a self destructive sort of culture. Um, because the more I invest that I'm a man, I'm this, I'm that, I build up my own ego. The more I have an ego, I see you as different. And the more I see you as different, I'm threatened by difference. Unfortunately, today, look at the world. If people appear different, I feel threatened by them. Actually, the reality of life, we are souls, we're a family. We're every little, we're not even men and women, we are souls. My understanding is the soul will take a female body a few times, a male body. We've all had both experiences, but we get so caught up in this, and it's a, it's this ego-based awareness, which is sort of a very like destructive thing in a way. 
And in turn, as I begin to really become aware of who I am, because we believe it. And that's the big thing between belief and experience. We believe it, we even quote it to people. It's in our scriptures. People say it from the pulpits and in the churches and temples. But we don't live it. We don't live it. And to me, what time is saying to us, we have to practice now. And really, I, I think I've spent nearly 50 years of my life every single day researching who I am and feeling. I ask myself, you know, what's the feeling of being this eternal soul? And the feeling of always existing. The soul's eternal. It can never not be. When I feel that, so much of my fear is broken down. Fear is based on loss mainly loss of my body. And sometimes I have the image in my mind, <clears throat> we're born. We say, this is my mum, this is my dad, these are my brothers, these are my sisters. You know, this is my country. And as we get older, this is my partner, these are my children. This is my profession, this is my business. You think, we build this identity, whole life investing. And one second I go, I leave the entire thing. You know, rather than understanding that actually I'm the soul doing all of this. Because the more I invest in almost every thing and I attach my heart, I have incredible fear of losing them. Fear is dominating our world at the moment. Why? It's because of ignorance, mainly because we've forgotten who we are. And it's mainly moving from knowing and believing to experiencing. And in a sense, meditation is like taking truth, who am I, and converting it into the feeling of peace. Because the intrinsic nature of the self is to be peaceful. But let's be real, it takes practice. It's true. <laughs> you know, we'd love it if it just happened overnight, but this is the spiritual journey. And the spiritual journey, I feel, <clears throat> you know, that the story of the hare and the tortoise, you know, that I think most of us know. The hares are the ones who something happens in life and I think, oh, I've got to meditate, I've got to go to the temple or something. And after a few weeks, I stop. You know, the tortoise is the one who every day just takes a step of self learning, a step of self awareness, a step closer to God. And every single day, and they grow. And I've seen some people. I've seen some people walk in the door of a meditation center really, I'd say, completely down about themselves and their lives. And then they begin to practice and then step slowly, slowly over the years and their face changes completely. Because the face is the index of the soul. And once the soul comes light again, all the light comes back into the face. It's something, it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing to see when I start to remember who I am and who I belong to. Mm. I don't know if anyone else wants to ask a question. Make a comment. Yes, I wanted to say something about ego. Ego means edging God out. <laughs> edging God out. And then about fear, you said about fear. Fear is thinking about something which doesn't exist. We are afraid of something that doesn't exist, in my opinion. And the best way to get rid of fear is to face fear. Thank you. <clears throat> It's a pleasure meeting you for the second time. We have your retreats from time back for the night to you. And um, you've been talking about the ego and meditation. But the biggest chunk of our life is out of meditation if we now job. And the structure of the society as it is. We talk of a structure whereby there is a hierarchy 
and it's dominating is how it is we eat each other uh, for free on BT, you know what about the proposition of our it is it goes contrary to what we is being taught in the meditation, whereby it reflects the ego. You like it or not, you try to retrieve that ego, you try to control it, to dominate it. But then, in the reality of the life, the majority of the time, it's the other duality, it's confronting, you have to bring it out, to exert your position, to express, express yourself. How do you reconcile? This <clears throat> my feeling is, I don't have to battle with my ego of superiority or my ego of inferiority. You know, I have to re-emerge my true self. And the more I'm living in the awareness of who I really am, they have less and less power over me. I've only developed a lot of ego because I've forgotten who I am. And, you know, often ego, I have this whole persona I present to the world that I, underneath that persona, I can feel very vulnerable, you know, um, very weak. And so <clears throat> the more, you know, my ego is here, my lack of self-respect is here, the more I grow, you know, who I am as a soul, the power of the ego and lack of or the ego and inferiority have less and less. So it's not like I'm trying to dismantle my ego, I'm trying to grow in my sense of self-awareness and automatically the ego dissipates. But what I was saying when we started that, you see, all of us here, we're living in a world, we all have families, we all have responsibilities. And you know one of the biggest conflicts I think in the history has been we're innately spiritual, and if I want to be spiritual, I have to go and live on a mountain or in a monastery or something. <laughs> and then I love my family and I want to also do my work. And really what we try to do here is bring them both together. And so that is the challenge, is not just to sit in the morning and meditate and then walk out the front door and forget it all, but actually carry it into my life. And you know, that's why the Brahma command is meditate with the eyes open. And once, some years ago, I was in San Francisco, and there was a scientist studying the effects of meditation. Now, all the scientific data, if you, if you go online, there, you know, someone told me recently, there's more studies into meditation than almost any other area of science at the moment. I find that fascinating because we're trying to understand more of who we are. A meditator can lower their brain wave at will. So you have four brain waves, you have beta, alpha, theta, delta. When you're beta, your mind is really fast. Alpha is when you're going into sleep. But a, a meditator can take their mind into that calming process. But what she was interested in, it's a fact meditators relax themselves. And that's a huge benefit for how you feel and your physical health too. But when you go back into busy situations, all of us have challenging life situations in families and work. Does your meditation work? And I had to sit in this little room for six hours, this little room, and I had all these electrodes put all over me. And the scientist asked me to meditate, and she recorded my brain waves. Then she asked me to sleep, and that's something I'm quite good at. So <laughs> I have that specialty. She recorded my brain, but then she gave me all these problems to do. So I had to give her answers, all types of problems. And you know what she said to me after? She said, what my research is showing me is people who meditate with their eyes open carry the meditation into their daily life. So you're not disconnecting your spiritual practice, your meditation with life, you're integrating it. To me, that's essential. And what I do is I wake up and meditate, but all day, I'm paying gentle attention to myself. I'm not stressing out. I'm watching how I'm thinking. I'm observing my own attitudes. 
taking ownership and constantly tweaking my thinking, trying to remain aware of myself and keep my link. The more you practice, the more you retain power. It's, this is the spiritual journey, actually, practicing constantly. Okay, maybe one last question. We'll leave the end. Just behind. Om Shanti. I wanted to know about meditation. Uh, you know, sometimes I, whenever I sit for to meditate, to concentrate, after sometimes all kinds of thoughts come to my mind. And sometimes I feel asleep, you know. I, I don't know how to keep that connection to the Supreme, how to continue that connection. Thank you. That's interesting because, <clears throat> you know, like I was just saying, some people, as soon as they relax, they go sleepy. Because when you, the mind is mostly at that beta level. Beta is you're active, you're overactive mentally. As soon as, you know when you go to sleep, alpha one is feeling tired, alpha two in the morning, alpha three is between waking and sleeping. As you meditate, you go into the alpha state and it subconsciously tells you it's time to sleep. And that's, if you keep your eyes open, that really helps. Every single person, when they begin to meditate, their mind wanders. And it's begin, you begin to become aware that in a sense, wherever your mind wants to, that's your karmic story. That's the unfinished business I'm holding in my life. It's like a magnet attracting you. And rather than fighting it, because sometimes we battle with ourselves and we don't feel happy. It's like the more I use love and wisdom, and I would say the absolute seed of quality meditation is love. So I'm not meditating on the point of light. Your mind will get your mind will get bored in one second. I'm having a relationship with a real lover. Actually, the only relationship that's permanent. And when I really, really feel not just use the language, but really develop this relationship, you'll find the law of life says wherever the heart goes, the mind will follow. You will have natural concentration. So I've really tried to deepen the relationship with the Supreme Soul. Really explore that. And I'm sure you'll find more natural concentration. Okay, so thank you so much for your patience, everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is just have a few moments of meditation. Is that okay? So, <clears throat> can I request that all of us maybe put down phones and books and things? <clears throat> and just follow the thoughts suggested, not just to hear them, but to feel them, to transform them into feeling inside. Oh. Um. 
journey of spirituality. It's the journey to reclaim my most power. The more I forgot who I am, the weaker I became. And I began to learn. to reclaim the power of the inner kingdom. I need to experience who I am. Visualize yourself. Sometimes it's so weak and vulnerable. But now, as I become so conscious, I step back into my inner power. I am a peaceful soul. Just allow yourself to be completely loved. Who is divine love consciously brought into your core of your being? Just relax. Open your soul.
We want to keep this <coughs> silence going on. So I will speak very less. We can all be we can all be one hand to thank our dear brother for your appreciation, showing the three our relationship very clear. I'm sure we're going to practice uh, more interpreting them in the end and bring them down to the heart. So thank you very much for coming. It's a really nice pleasure to see you all here. And we hope to have another program in future. Thank you very much. Thanks again.